On October 30th, 2002, 40 FBI agents raided Tenet Healthcare's Reading Medical Center in Reading, California, and the cardiology associates of Northern California's offices of a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. In December 2004, Tenet, the country's second largest hospital chain at the time, agreed to pay $395 million to 769 victims of unnecessary heart surgeries performed at Reading Medical Center. The treating cardiologist agreed to pay a total of $24 million. The two doctors were Dr. Che Hung Moon and Dr. Fidel Rili Vasquez Jr. But the doctors weren't just isolated renegades, no. They worked for Tenet Healthcare that squeezed as much profit as possible out of its hospital. This is a story not only of 769 victims, but also a story about corporate greed and about two doctors who turned their positions into conveyor belts for fame and money. Coronary surgeries were a cash cow for Tenet. And here's three Tenet Healthcare victims to tell their stories. My mother was a patient of Dr. Moon and his ability to coerce her into these operations and many other people really, really upset me because there were some things done to her that didn't need to be done. Her health was not that perfect, but it wasn't that bad. And in the end, she passed away from a needless operation. He took away so much, especially um, my trust in men especially, um, professional men. Uh, because I don't know that everything they're saying is, is true anymore. Um, I, I had, I, it was very hard for me because um, we didn't talk about what happened. I, I don't, I'm not ashamed of, of what happened. I am so annoyed that he did the surgery to so many. Um, you don't do that. You don't do that. We're here in America. He caused me a lot of pain for his improper diagnosis of my condition, for doing an improper surgery or an improper heart cath wasn't necessary, and for leading me on to a surgery from another heart surgeon that I didn't need to go through at a time in my life that I was fairly stressful anyway. I just won an election for assessor of our county. Uh, my folks were not in good health. There was a lot of new things coming coming at me at one time, and then I had to go through this heart surgery. Um, it was very difficult. I would like everybody to know the truth about Dr. Moon, Riley Vasquez, and their band of butchers that worked with them. And there was hospitals behind that, the staff was behind that. There needs to be something done as far as this fraudulent thing that went on. There was too many people involved in this that had surgeries that were unnecessary. And the, I'm mad at the medical profession, because they didn't police themselves. I mean, that's a mad legal profession because they didn't criminally indict these people and put them in jail where they should be. I believe that doctors who lie for the sake of money need to go to jail. They need to, they need to suffer themselves. We're gonna suffer the rest of our lives. And money isn't, money isn't everything and they did it for money, that was all they did it for. Doctors that do these things to people, no matter how serious they are, if they're fraudulent or wrong, should be punished more than just their license taken away. Insurance covered all of the different lawsuits that would happen to these people, and they're out now doing whatever they want to do, play golf or anything else. My folks can't do that because they're both gone. You guys got away with it. And, and the rest of us had to sit back and just watch it happen when everybody else dropped the ball. And they dropped the ball. And I'm sorry, but I, I, have, I have no good feelings for you, you know, at all. None of you. In this insider-exclusive Investigative Network TV special, America's Hospital of Horrors, Tenet Healthcare, the $400 million healthcare fraud story, our news team travels to Redding, California to go behind the headlines to meet with Russ Reiner and Richard Frankel, partners at Reiner, Slaughter, McCartney, and Frankel Law Offices, and some of their clients and their families to better understand the big picture of how tenant hospitals 
put profit ahead of people and how they violated the sacred Hippocratic oath, do no harm. Russ and Richard and their law firm successfully got justice for their 325 clients. But despite the overwhelming evidence of fraud, the legal challenges to pursue justice for their victims were extremely complex. As Russ succinctly said, my clients and their families suffered horrible complications. These were completely healthy people with no heart problems. Tenant Healthcare is absolutely no stranger to major fraud in lawsuits, both from the government and on behalf of patients. They have a history of violating the trust of Americans and patients with a corporate rap sheet to prove it. And they became the poster child for unethical business practices. Here's just a few of Tenant Healthcare's publicly documented fraud settlements on their extensive corporate rat sheet. In the early 1990s, as National Medical Enterprises, which later changed its name to Tenet Healthcare, they were accused of committing fraud by admitting thousands of psychiatric patients who did not need hospitalization and then charging these patients inflated prices. In 1991, the federal government investigated the company for fraud and conspiracy. In 1993, Law enforcement raided company offices in an attempt to show that the company was defrauding patients and insurance companies. In 1994, 600 federal agents raided 20 of National Medical Enterprises offices, resulting in settlement fraud charges with the United States and 28 states involving payments of a record $380 million at the time and federal guilty pleas on eight criminal counts by two of its units. In 2004, Tenet paid $395 million to 769 patients in this case story to settle litigation for the unnecessary surgeries. The scandal and subsequent federal investigation are described in the book Coronary, a true story of medicine gone awry. In 2006, Tenet agreed to pay $725 million in cash and give up $175 million of Medicare payments for a total of $900 million in fees to resolve claims it defrauded the federal government for overbilling Medicare claims during the 1990s. For those who had unneeded surgery, the psychological effects, the sense of betrayal, the loss of trust, the fear are devastating. The physical results for those who survive may be even more difficult to assess. The doctor-patient relationship is a sacred trust. The fact that it could be violated is devastating. In this insider-exclusive Investigative Network TV special, we examine America's medical industrial complex and lay bare the financial structures that drive the American healthcare system and which precipitated Moon's and really Vasquez's actions in a scheme that placed the demands of Wall Street above the lives of its patients. Tenet Healthcare rewarded doctors based on how much revenue they generated for their corporation. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Redding, California. my great pleasure to introduce Russ Reiner to the show and Richard Frankel. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We're here today talking about a most unusual case uh, which dealt with tenant health care. But before we get into this, I want our audience to know that your firm represents the little people of the world, right? Is that what you do? Correct. And so when someone comes to you with some sort of you know, problem and that sort of thing. You analyze the case and see whether you can pursue this on their behalf, right? Yes. In this particular case, tell us the facts, because there was more than one individual that came to you, right? Right. Well, in our community in Reading, um, there were um, a total of um, 800 people that we ultimately screened and underwent these unnecessary heart um, bypass and valve surgeries. Mm -hmm. And um, 
anyway, what um, what happened was is that um, we early on had several clients that um, had to have a particular surgery. They may have had to have a knee operation, and they would go in and at this hospital. And, there were, and by the way, there were only two hospitals in Reading at the time, right? Correct. Reading Medical Center, which was owned by Tenet Healthcare, correct? Correct. And another hospital. And Mercy Medical Center. Right. And uh, Reading Medical Center was known as the Heart Hospital in Reading, and uh, Mercy Medical Center was the Cancer Center in Reading, and okay. that's kind of where patients went. And so um, before this case happened, um, a lot of people outside of Reading from around the state came to Reading because they claimed that they had the best rate for less complications, less people dying from heart surgeries than anywhere else. People would go in for like a knee surgery or an ankle surgery, and if they were older, you would have to have uh, like a stress test to know whether you could survive the surgery. Well, the system that they had here at Reading Medical Center is you would go in for a knee surgery and they would say, aha, you need to do this stress test. So they would then, this Dr. Moon, they would do a stress test and then they would say, oh, you know, we see something. And so there might be a problem. And so then Dr. Moon would convince them to have this angiogram, which is supposedly the gold standard. Uh, many of these people didn't want to have an angiogram because they would say, you know, we don't really need it. And he would say to them, you know, uh, heart disease is a silent killer. Sometimes you don't have any um, effects on your body yet, but it could be a silent killer. We should yeah. do an angiogram. He was selling fear, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. And the way that he would trap a lot of people because he would say there are little complications from doing an angiogram. And if there was a test, to tell whether or not you had cancer or didn't have cancer, would you do the test? And oh my God, when people would hear cancer, then they would say, okay, I'll do the test. So then Dr. Moon would do this angiogram. And many times the angiogram would show nothing. It would be clear. So this Dr. Moon, who the public didn't know at the time, was not board certified. He did another test called IVUS. And it was something designed by Stanford. And an IVUS is not to determine if you have heart disease or if you need a surgery. An IVUS was a procedure to determine whether or not where to place a particular stent. Dr. Moon sold this idea that everybody in our body, we have hard plaque. That's what builds up. That's the problem. But we all have what's called soft plaque. And that soft plaque goes through our system all of the time. But Moon sold this idea, Dr. Moon, that um, this soft plaque could build up and kill you. So the money part of it was the angiogram would take four to 10 minutes. He would just uh, use a different calf to do the IVUS right afterwards. Mm -hmm. They would charge another 15 or 20,000 for the IVUS. That would take four to six minutes. And then he would say, aha, I see something on this IVUS and you need to have a surgery. Would they show the patient, I see something on this IVUS? Would they show them something? They would just tell them. Doctor, show them. Was there anything to show? No, and, and I'll tell you, beyond <laughs> that, at, and, and I know we're getting ahead of ourselves, no. but uh, Raleigh Vasquez, who was the primary, it takes two people to do this conspiracy. Right. You needed the cardiologist to do the angiogram and say, and that was Moon. Moon, that yeah. you need the surgery, and then you need the cardiovascular surgeon to do the surgery. Right. So you needed them both. And they both knew what was going on. 100%. Okay. And at, at the end of the day, when uh, Dr. RV was trying to defend himself so he wouldn't lose his medical license, he testified in front of the California Medical Board that he could not read an IVUS. Doctor, if you can imagine, Dr. Raleigh Vasquez, could not read an IVUS, yeah. so he blamed Dr. Moon. Yeah, but my question is, what's there to read? There wasn't anything there, <laughs> right. But when you think about it, uh, think about if you broke your leg and yeah. they did an X-ray to see where your fracture was, and then the orthopedic surgeon was going to um, you know, brace or, or fix the fracture. Mm -hmm. Here, Raleigh Vasquez, nothing shows on the angiogram. He's operating based upon the IVUS, he can't eat, read an IVUS, what's he operating on, right? right? There's whatever, there's nothing. 
So, and, and I know we're getting ahead of ourselves, yeah. but in the long game, Moon gave up his license after all this is over. But Raleigh Vasquez still has his license, I understand. Yes, but but um, under the agreement, uh, Raleigh Vasquez could no longer um, perform a heart surgery. Yeah. He could no longer be a cardiovascular surgeon. Right. That was part of the agreement at the end. Now, in the beginning of the show, we've talked about how many unnecessary heart operations were performed. And you represented, I think, 325 patient clients, right? Yeah, we represented 345 patients. 345. There were a, a total of um, 800 yeah. patients that were determined to be unnecessary. Right. Tell our audience some of, and we're going to meet some of your clients and patients here later today, but tell our audience what were some of the complications of undergoing unnecessary heart surgery. Sure. So first of all, the patients that we represented ranged in age from the youngest was 29, the oldest was 90. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, uh, you know, which one, you know, whatever was worse. Um, whenever you do uh, a bypass surgery mm -hmm. or a valve surgery, um, some of the complications can be death. Um, others can be um, a stroke. Um, another major thing can be um, infections because when you do a bypass surgery, you take what are called saphenous veins out of your legs and you use those to bypass, okay? So uh, a lot of people that have diabetes, um, they get infections. So clients that we represented, uh, there were people that died. Uh, there were people that had strokes. Yeah. Uh, and there were people that had severe infections as a result of, of the veins being out. And we had people that had amputations where they, uh, they lost their legs. As, as a result re of having unnecessary surgery. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. I also want to talk a little bit about some of the ongoing investigations while you were representing your clients with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI. Okay. Because in many people's viewpoint, this was considered criminal, what they did. Right. And yet, there was never any prosecution, there was never any indictment, correct? Correct. Um, what do you have to say about why that happened? Um, part of that would be speculation, but, but, uh, the FBI came to Reading right. with 40 FBI agents yeah, and they, and they raided a, their office. They raided the office and they raided the hospital. Okay. Then there was a, um, a grand jury set up in Sacramento, mm -hmm. uh, where the FBI for three and a half years conducted this, um, uh, grand jury. I mean, they supplied information, I should say, to the grand jury. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, there's two parts of the case. There's the civil case right. where we represent for damages, and there's the criminal side, which yes. we didn't have control over. But anyway, um, ultimately, it was determined on the criminal side, they dropped the grand jury and um, anyway, they were not prosecuted. What are you speculating again? What do you think the reason why they weren't prosecuted? Was it because of the settlement or what? No, it had nothing to do with the settlement. Yeah. I don't know, Richard, I, if you want to yeah, comment on it. I mean, again, as Russ says, it's somewhat yeah. speculation. With, right. But comparing it to other healthcare fraud yeah. cases, I think two things, two or three things were going on. One was that the government, through um, both Senate investigations and um, the it was a, a it was a criminal and civil investigation within the government. Right. At the end of the day, they shut down the hospital. They forced Tenet to sell the hospital. Yes. They effectively shut down the doctors, and um, the hospital paid a significant fine, about uh, I think fifty or sixty million dollars. Yeah. And um, so they were left with the question: Do we prosecute the doctors criminally? Yeah. And um, my experience has been that U.S. attorneys are reluctant to bring cases involving quality of health care as criminal cases. Yeah. They're difficult, keeping in mind you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt yeah. 
that these doctors intentionally did this. Right. And so, uh, so that's, I think that's probably right. so into the, to the... Let me ask you a question. IVIS, right? IVIS? Yes. If the IVIS test didn't show anything, it would seem pretty clear that he was deciding to perform an operation based on no evidence. Correct. Yeah, and the IVIS, it's called an intravascular ultrasound. Yes. And you're correct. And so when we got this case, and again, an angiogram is the gold standard. Yes. We believe like an angiogram is like the DNA. So let me, like, whatever, briefly explain. In your body, you have three main arteries. It's yes. like three rivers. And your blood flows through those arteries. And so when they do an angiogram, they put dye in, mm -hmm. and they watch whether or not the dye goes through those rivers. And if it doesn't, if it's, it's blocked, yes. whatever, you can see it. So in this case, what, what we did with the angiograms in order to get some of the greatest experts in the country, uh, these are on like a, a DVD. Mm -hmm. And so we sent to Stanford and to the Mayo Clinic um, and other institutions around the country like 10 angiograms um, because doctors from around the country had heard about this, but yeah. they really couldn't believe that somebody would be doing this. So yeah. we sent those and um, they reviewed the, the angiograms and they saw they were, they were clean. In fact, the, the, one of the uh, um, chief cardiovascular surgeons from the Mayo Clinic stated that, you know, I would give a student an F if they would ever right. recommend a bypass because there's nothing on the angiogram. Right. But then we get into, as in all medical malpractice cases, the experts battle, right? Right. One doctor says it shouldn't have been done. Another one says, well, you weren't there. I know what had to be done, correct? Correct. And I think that makes it difficult to prosecute on a criminal level. Don't you agree? It, it does. And it also keep in mind, you know, intent yeah. is a key element in a criminal case. It's not true in a civil case. Mm -hmm. And so if people believe that Dr. Moon really believed yeah. that the IVUS was some revolutionary technique that he could do things that other people couldn't do, right. then it's harder to prove that he did it with criminal intent. Right. And uh, let's talk about your clients and let's talk about the community. This is a small community. Yes. Um, Dr. Moon was perceived as kind of a, a good doctor, wasn't he? he yes. Was perceived as, he was perceived as he had saved a lot of people's lives, right? Yes. yes. And then you look at the jury poll here, and they were kind of torn because how could they believe such a doctor, two doctors, and a healthcare company would actually perform so many unnecessary cardiac um, uh, operations, all for all in the name of money? Correct. Correct. And what happened here was this, um, and I'll just tell you. And we want to. And by the way, we want to talk about that because we want to talk about the challenges you faced. Right. Because you settled the cases. Right. But you had over 300 clients. Had you brought them to trial, it would have been years, right? Right. Right. To try these cases. So, Go ahead. Right. So let me tell you. So first of all, both Dr. Moon and Dr. RV mm -hmm. were considered to be the preeminent doctors in this community. Yes. And, and uh, they had given, you know, they were paid millions and millions of dollars every year for the what they were doing because the hospital was making a fortune yes. based upon this. So anyway, what Dr. Moon and Dr. RV did, they had scholarships set up. They would give money to high schools. They would do all of this. So they were elevated to this. And so uh, when this happened and people kept coming forward, there were a lot of people in this community that wouldn't accept this. Um, in addition, tenant, yeah. Um, actually did a um, PR program where when this happened, they hired people and they had uh, demonstrations um, in at both at the hospital and at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. When we were bringing these motions, they would have people holding up signs. It was all a put up deal. Yeah. But they had hundreds of people supporting Dr. Moon and Dr. RV. And during our case, we were able to establish that tenant was coming into our community yeah. and and getting these people to hold up signs and do all of these right. things. We uh, discussed earlier in the show, in the beginning of the show, about tenant health care. And I believe they used to be named National Medical Enterprises. And I like to say that they have a well-established corporate rap sheet 
because over the years they have probably paid the government close to, I don't know, three or four billion dollars in fines, reimbursed, you know, the government, that sort of thing. Um, would you say that Tenet Healthcare was in collusion with the doctors to say, hey docs, you know, if you start doing a lot more operations, we'll make more money and you'll make more money? Unequivocally, yes. Yeah, but it, nobody will ever admit that, will they? they? No, they won't. They won't admit that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, Tenet paid uh, three hundred ninety-five million dollars. Right. And it's important for the public to understand too is that that was not insurance money. Yeah. That was money that they had earned because this was a fraud case. Right. And there, the doctors' insurance companies paid what twenty-four million? No, they paid. Um, On a total of about uh, 20, about $45 million. $45 million. Yes. Okay. Um, what does this say about our health care system in America where a company like Tenet, who has an extensive corporate rap sheet, again and again they're charged with fraud, again and again they sign consent decrees and pay the government, but they are still in business. What's it say about our health care system? They're the worst of the worst that are doing health care based upon mm -hmm. money as the yeah. goal, not the health of the patient. You know, for all of these patients, you know, do you drive them into bankruptcy? Yes. And if you do, then, you know, the client... There's you know, no money. There's no money. Yeah. It, it's a very difficult yeah. question, you know, to answer. But, but clearly in its past, Tenet has done, you know, bad things, not yeah. only on heart cases, but... Uh, Richard, um, when this case started, um, I brought in um, several firms from Texas, and Richard was one of those firms. Right. And Richard had had a prior case where tenant, against tenant against yeah. tenant yeah. for psychiatric hospitals right. as part of that case. I think that was 1993, 94, or something like that, right? Yeah, the case was yeah. in 1995, but yes, the government investigation. Right. In that case, there were guilty pleas, yeah. were criminal. Yeah, but Actually, when you, I read that, I remember it, 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 there were criminal admissions of guilt. Yes, felony, but, no one went to jail. Yeah, yeah, but it's against a corporation. And that's like me finding that tree out there guilty of a felony. Right, right, right. 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 No, the, I mean, it's pointless, the, right? The, the only thing I would say about that yeah. uh, in that particular case was that a couple of executives, yeah. vice president levels, yeah. did go to prison. Did they? Yes, they did. Do they have to pay back restitution or anything? I don't know that they personally had the money. Okay. I don't remember that. But uh, but that's some. That, the government ha yeah. is changing its attitude, yeah. and um, now targeting executives rather than just the corporation itself. And mm -hmm. I think that could change things. As long as, as you point out, as long as it's the corporation just handing back shareholders' money, um, it just keeps happening. Right. Right. So um, today, fortunately, we have some of your clients, uh, two of whom underwent, you know, these unnecessary heart operations, and one, the son of somebody who has passed on, who had to take care of his mom. Um, so we're going to bring him on right now. Okay. Right. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Colombo and Peggy Rutherford to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. You guys have been through hell and back, haven't you? Been difficult. Yeah. When you were initially, when you to, went to Reading Medical Center, and you, what reason did you go to the medical center there for initially? Because during the night I had an angina attack. Okay. I had the. And how old were you at the time? At that time. I don't know, seventy something. Okay, fine. And so, I didn't wake up my husband because it's. The pain is gone. Right. Whatever. And so the next morning, when we were after we had breakfast, I said, I need to tell you something, which is not a good thing to say. Last night, this is what happened. Well, he immediately called our family doctor and um, Reed and said, this is what happened. And he said, would you get her to the ER? I was not upset going to the hospital um, because I knew they were just going to do I knew. An EKG and it's, I'm fine. I really was fine. Right. We get there, it didn't work that way. They put me on the table and we talked a little bit and then they put the band on. And I said, I don't 
I don't need that. Do you want to hear all No, that? who's, yes, who is they? They are the medical people okay, in fine. the ER. But when did Dr. Moon enter the picture? You know what? They, because I wasn't going to stay and I was getting angry, that they called Dr. Moon and yeah. he did he gave me some kind of a medication that put me out. Right. I did not really come to until I'm walking down the hall to my room from recovery. I knew nothing in that, that period of time. So you had already had the heart operation? No. Okay. Well, during, during that period, they, like I said, the last I remember was them saying, me telling them I'm not staying. Right. And then I guess they gave me the shot, whatever. My husband insisted that it be Dr. Moon and Dr. Right. Real, Dr. Fred. So your husband was kind of making decisions there for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because he already had surgery. Right. From, he did? Yes. With Dr. Moon? Yes. Okay, fine. And he liked Dr. Moon? Oh, he did. Yeah. Was, I mean, he was number one. Okay. They both were number one. The hospital right. was number one. Why? Right. We had, I kept everything. I kept yeah. paperwork. That's what you saw. So then you had the operation and, yes. okay, so then you go home and how are you feeling? You know, um, I'm fine. Um, I'm I'm. I'm okay. I'm, yeah. I'm working with whatever he told me to do is yeah. what I'm doing, and the, the pillow, of course, okay. for protection. Um, we went to to dinner yeah, yeah. ten days later, and then we went to the coast about yeah. fifteen days after that. Okay. So, how long after the operation were you made aware of that maybe your heart operation wasn't necessary? Oh my goodness! Just a matter of months. Uh, months. Because it was. It was. How'd you find out? My friend called me and said that he was contacted by, by, I guess, a, anyway. Um, the FBI? The FBI, thank yeah. you. And that his records were pulled yeah. and that his surgeries were not necessary. What was your so, initial reaction when your friend called you? You I didn't thought, believe it, right? No, I thought, Tony, you know, that don't do that to us. Yeah. Um, we're friends. We don't, don't tell us stories. Yeah. And then the next thing he calls, he says he's going to either Chico or Red Bluff with the FBI yeah. to confirm everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, and your husband adored Dr. Moon, right, did. initially, right? Yes. Okay, so when you were told this, you probably shared that information with your husband, right? Well, we did it together. Yeah. We were very close. Everything was done yeah, yeah. together. So, so he yeah. probably said, this is this is crazy, correct? Your husband? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't believe Tony. So when did it dawn on you that maybe this was actually a reality, that maybe you had had unnecessary heart surgery soon thereafter? Week. We went ahead and brought our paperwork here to yeah. Russ Reiner. And he had a, 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 a cardiac a, a, secretary, a cardiac nurse yeah. who read my paperwork, right. my booklet, yes. and she said, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, yeah. you did not need the surgery. There is nothing here showing yeah. that you needed surgery. And I thought, whoa, oh, oh, okay. okay. So what was your immediate reaction? Well, I, I didn't believe it. You didn't believe it. That oh, was initially, you didn't believe it. Well, n no, nobody's going to do that to anybody. Okay, so after you started believing it and seeing the evidence mount up, what did you feel like then? I was angry. angry. Not for myself, but I thought if he did it to me, he did it to Tony, he did yeah. it to Al. Well, as you know, as it came out in the works, you know, there's almost 800 people that they did it to. 800. Yes. And they did it for what reason? Right. To make money. Right. Yeah. What do you feel about that? And uh, big anger because he, yeah. he I, I just was angry. I yeah. mean, he put your life in jeopardy. You could have died. There's people that die. Mm -hmm. You know? So you know, how do you feel about dying? How do you feel about this? Doctor Moon, no longer a doctor, is walking around, was never prosecuted criminally. What do you think about that? It bothers me something terrible. I don't want to run into the man. Yeah. Um I um no, I was angered and I had said something even to to Russ about the fact nothing came out of his pocket. Yeah. Here's a man out there who did so much wrong and he was never punished mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Mark. Yes. Similar experience, you know, why did you go to the hospital to begin with? It started, I just got elected assessor in March of 2002, and I was tired, and my wife said, why don't you go have a physical? Yeah. So I went to my primary care physician, 
He ran some tests. It looked like my cholesterol was on a high level. He said, go to MD Imaging, have this test. It's a calcium scoring something for your arteries. Yeah. And we got the results, and he looked at him. He said, you know, you should go to a cardiologist and have him look at it and see what's up. This was another doctor that recommended Another doctor recommended but he just go pick the cardiologist. Well, yeah. my wife and I have heard about Moon, and up here she had a business here in Reading. Had Redding. a good reputation. Good reputation. Yeah. So we picked him, and he set an appointment. And it was amazing because we went into his office together, yeah. and he comes in. He never put a stethoscope on me. Yeah. He never examined me. Right. All he could talk about was that doctors, other cardiologists that are using treadmills, can't tell anything with it. It's not a good process. Yeah. Whatever. You need a heart cath. He went right to it, right off without the bat. Without examining. Without examining. Didn't, me. Find, didn't you find that kind of unusual? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, I'm, it's not my business. You know, yeah. I'm in the assessment business. That yeah. was my business. And you see a guy with a white coat, good reputation. Oh, for sure. Yeah. He did, you know that paper that's laying on the uh, table that you get examined on? Yeah, yeah. He took a felt pen out and he was doing all this doodling and all this kind of stuff, explaining stuff. So, okay. So, did he have any dollar signs on I, the paper? There was no dollar signs, but it was all <laughs> kinds of stuff that, that, you know, okay, that means something, but yeah. just tell me what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. So he said, you need a heart cast. So, yeah. okay, I'll do that. So we set, and this was at the end of May, I think very beginning of June. So mid-June, we had an appointment at, at Reading Med for the heart cath. So he did the heart cath and he turned off the machine and he said, I can't do anything for you. You need a bypass surgery. And I'm going, wow. And I'm just sitting there thinking, how could that be? Yeah, he's sucking you in. He, oh, well, that was the whole thing. So yeah. I, I go downstairs and he brings some photos down to show to my wife. And he says, see this thing here? And who knows? I, we yeah. don't know. And he's showing, he said, that's where the widow maker is yeah. right there. Widow maker. Widow maker. Use, the, you? use the weird widow maker. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm telling you, so she's scared now. Yeah. So, uh, we said, well, we need a second opinion. Yeah. And so they went out, and I don't know which doctor made the second opinion, one of the surgeons I take. At it, the same hospital. At the same hospital on the day that that heart cath was done. Yeah. And came back, and, and here's the phrase. If you leave this hospital, I take no responsibility for what happens to you. Do you think it scared my wife? <laughs> scared the heck out of me. Yeah. And so we said, okay, I guess we have to have a bypass. The next day, we had the bypass. So yeah. here's going full well, back, going to... You went home. I never you? went home. I stayed in the hospital. I was scared. He said, if you, if you go home, yeah. something might happen. Yeah, we yeah. don't want any responsibility for that. <clears throat> so that was a second opinion from, I take it, one of the surgeons. Yeah. And, and next thing you know, we're having the surgery, and I come home after four or five days and, and start feeling better. Yeah. You know? Well, I had more blood running through my system. Yeah. Now I had two, two veins plus the artery that was still really good. So I was more alert and whatever, um, but I didn't need it. So have you had any complications, both of you? Had you had any complications as a result of this unnecessary surgery? None. Okay. The only thing I have is a, a, a pain up here, especially when I lay on my side. Yeah. But nobody knows why. Because they opened your sternum, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They made your surgery. You you feel stiff. Yeah, they yeah. open, they take your heart, they put you on a machine. Yeah, how long ago was this? 2002, June of 2002. So it's been 15 years. 15 years. I hadn't I hadn't taken office yet. I mean, my wife was really nervous, you know. You were uh, 55 years old. I was 54. 54. At that time when I had it. Okay, yeah. so... In the long run, okay, um, what do you think should have been done to Dr. Moon and Dr. R.V., both of you? And mine was yeah. jail for sure. Dr. Brissett was mine, but without a doubt. I mean, they got they really did get away with it. Yeah. The fact that I know that, that uh, with the attorneys and the yeah. lawsuit, it didn't come out of their pockets. It came out of their yeah. insurance companies. It came out of... Um, tenant paid the biggest bill right and so they just got away with paying their attorney bills you know and and with as much damage as they did one of those young men they busted him open and they could never put him back together again really one you of know, the one of the one, 800 one of the, people one of them yeah and he's, he's on a morphine pump for the rest of his life oh my god now, how bad is that I, yeah. it, it, those they should have definitely gone to jail i'm I, the system really failed yeah the medical system failed the legal system failed and the yeah. political system failed. Pressure was put on McGregor yeah. Scott, the attorney. What do you think about, what's your opinion of Russ Reiner and his law firm about how they handled the case? Fantastic. I think they did a really good job. They, yeah. did. they put everything they have, yeah. heart. Everything in it. Everything in it. Yeah. And I, I just think that. And, and I understand you're a great admirer of Russ, is that right? 
I am. Just yes, I am. Just because of all of this, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for yeah. no other reason than yeah. that. Yeah. So they were. Did, did the question ever come job. to you that say, "Why me"? <laughs> it's more than why me. Yeah. yeah. I know, I why, 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 why one person yeah, yeah, yeah. went through this right. is not, okay. not right. I just can't believe that somebody that takes a Hippocratic oath. Right, do no harm. Do no harm. And the, what they did for, for power. Yeah. Because they and had money. Power. And money. I mean, Moon used to fly with a helicopter over to the golf course to play golf from Ready Med. I mean, this stuff was, it was bad. And, it was yeah. bad. And, 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 everybody, and people had to know about it. Yeah. It took a Catholic priest. Father Carapi right. to blow the whistle and bring 40 FBI agents to Re to, right. to Reading to yeah. bust this thing. It's wrong. And why were the doctors around here that knew this this yeah. was wrong? Well, I want to thank both of you for being on the show and sharing your story because uh, you know let's hope this never happens again anywhere in America and the doctors that do this are put in jail. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My great pleasure to introduce Shannon Wooten to the show. Welcome to the show, Shannon. Thank you. you are the son of a one of Dr. Moon and RV's victim patients, aren't you? Yes, I am. Tell our audience a little bit about what you went through, and your mom's name was Shirley, right? Correct. Tell our audience a little bit about what you went through when she had her surgery. Well, and by the way, let me ask you a question. Were you involved in making the decision about her having surgery? No, I wasn't. Okay. She made the decision on her own, okay. and uh, she was diagnosed with calcium deposits floating in her blood. And if she did, that's have why it, she went into the correct, hospital correct. to begin with. And so, while she was in there, basically, she was held captive because they said, "If you don't have this operation, you should die." Yeah. And so, and who told her that? Doctor Moon. Okay. And so, in the conversation with the rest of the family, yeah. it sounded the right thing to do yes. because we're not doctors. We're yeah, you doctors. Didn't, nobody questions what a doctor no. says, right? Because at that time, he was the man in town. Yeah. And so everybody said, well, yeah, it sounded all right. Mm. And uh, she had the operation. Everything went fine. And she walked, after she got out of the hospital, she was exercising. She walked down to the mailbox, it was about 60 yards, and just to get her daily exercise. And so she was really pushing herself to do the right thing. And one day, my wife, we live, they, my mom and my dad live near us up in the front part of my property. And so I had some big warehouses that I run a bee operation out of for a long time. And so my wife came over and she says, I want to go see your folks now. And I said, wait a minute. And something told me I needed to be up there. So I ran through the warehouse, I shut the lights off, shut the machinery down and jumped in the car with her and we went up there. And so we we're sitting down at the dining room table. And Mom says, you know, I've had some pains in my chest today. And so I called the nurse, and she said, well, it's just the healing process. It'll be OK. And in the conversation, we just stand sitting there talking to Mom. Let me, let me stop you here yeah. for a second. Is that true? Is it part of the healing process in a cardiac op afterwards? Do people have pains? Yes, because it's, uh, a, again, they they cut your chest open, yeah. and so yes, the, when they right. there's about a four to six week process where you're healing up because it's a big procedure right, where right, they right. open you up. So yeah. that's true. Okay, that is true. Yeah. So she and, had some pains. The nurse right. said part of the procedure. Right. And so, in our talking back and forth, she reached up. She says, "Boy, that pain is really getting bad." And I said, "Well, maybe you should call that nurse again." Yeah. So she picked up the phone. And she remembered the numbers. She had this ability to remember numbers. She dialed about three numbers, and she dropped the phone. And her head went back, and her eyes opened. And when she did, then they were fixed and dilated, and she gasped, and it started gurgling. She basically died right there. And my dad says, we've got to do something. And so I picked her up, and I said, get the chair. And I flopped her on the floor, and I gave her mouth to mouth. And it took about two breaths, and she came to, and she turned, and she threw up, which is the trauma part of doing that. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, my wife's on the phone. My dad jumps in the pickup to run out to the road and put the flashers on to get everybody in there, because we don't live too far from the fire department. They were there just a few minutes. And so they gathered her up, took her into the hospital. And so what had happened, 
was the glue that this is what they explained to us. The glue that they used to put the artery back together had gave way. So basically she had a major aneurysm right there. And her her heart basically had stopped. And so by flopping her on the floor and getting her back out, somehow this thing kind of coagulated over, got the heart going back again. And we had to do heart surgery that night. And so in about two o'clock. By, by whom? Who did the heart Dr. surgery? Dr. Rochette, the same one that did okay. the first surgery. All right. And so, and I'm think I'm hope I'm saying that name right, Rochette or Bruchette, but anyway. Bruchette. Bruchette, okay, it's Bruchette, because I, some of these things I don't remember as far as the details, but anyway. And Dr. Brousset, by the way, was a heart surgeon that worked with Dr. Right. RV, yeah, and right. he was one of the ones that he also lost after this case. He could no longer perform heart surgery. So he was, for lack of a better term, part of the scam. Precisely. Okay, fine. Yeah. So anyways, they came in about 2 o'clock in the morning and said, well, we've, we've been able to have a successful operation but we had to keep the blood away from your mother's brain for about an hour mm -hmm. and he said that's too much and so it's got there will be some brain damage how much we don't know so in her recuperation we would visit her every day in the hospital well, part of the medication that they had her on would create these jerks she would jerk really, really bad. Yeah. Was she coherent? Could she yes. talk? Yes, and she, she So you speak. didn't see any evidence she, of brain no. damage? No, and everything seemed to be pretty good at that yeah. point in time. And so they'd bring her meals into her, and she couldn't eat because she'd just get like that and flip the food all over the place. So we would go in, and after talking to the nurse's staff, they didn't seem to have enough to help her feed herself. Yeah. So we would go in at mealtime and try to get her fed at least. So in, in her... Uh, healing process, everything seemed to be pretty good. Her motor skills were pretty well limited. And in time, we found out that her memory wasn't too good. She could remember names and things like that. But as far as, as what had happened to her, she couldn't remember. And some other things in, in the recent part of her life, she couldn't remember very well. Mm -hmm. And it never did really come back out. But her motor skills was just about destroyed. She had an awful time moving around the house when she would come home. Uh, Dad would just have to be there with her all the time. She'd get up and walk, she'd fall down. Yeah. And she fell into the mirror once and she cut her face pretty bad. She fell and broke her hip once and Dad you know, she got hurt, so they took her to the hospital. Yeah. Well, they released her that, that afternoon. They yeah. said, we didn't find anything wrong. And so I was there when Dad brought her home. We got Still her going to the same Reading Medical Center. Exactly, okay. same place. And so I lifted her up out of the chair, wheelchair, and put her into bed. And when I did, it hurt so bad, she threw up. Yeah. And she couldn't tell us how bad it was hurting because of her inability to think very well. Yeah. We asked her over and over, does that hurt? Well, I think so. And she couldn't really express herself. Very so well. she had the operation in 2002. Right. Okay. And, and then this was, then she had the second one just within seven to eight days after the right, first right, right. one. And then how much longer was she alive? She died in 05. Okay, two yeah. more years. So you went through right. two more years of this. And so this broken hip thing, when yeah. she went back in, they sent her home. And so then the very next morning, the hospital called and says, you better bring Shirley back in. We think she's got a broken hip. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's, you either do or you don't. Right. And so why didn't they have expertise yeah. looking at this thing? Yeah, we've got to fix this thing right yeah. away. So it just went on and on and on. Well, to, it got to the point that her balance was very, very poor, and so she sat up on the corner of the bed when, one morning. She slipped off the bed, and she hit her head on the nightstand. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't very bad. It didn't seem to be too bad. And Dad had been taking her to the chiropractor because she was not moving around enough, and her back hurt pretty bad. So he would work her over and help her get back to where she was pretty good. So she had this awful headache. So Dad loaded her up, took her to the chiropractor. And so then I talked to him later that day and he said, I don't know what is the matter with your mother, but there's something wrong because I couldn't fix her. Well, that night she slipped into a coma and she never came out of it. Right. And she had a brain aneurysm is what happened. So when did you find out about what was really going on here with Moon and RV? Um, it was 
after, and I'm not quite sure, but prior to mother passing away, we were contacted by the lawyer's office and said, yeah. we were having some difficulty with some of these cases. Yeah. We'd like to interview you. In the meantime, there's one point I wanted to bring out. When I was reading the, this doctor column in the record searchlight, mm -hmm. and it had this lady wrote in, she says, I have calcium deposits floating in my blood. Do I need heart surgery? Mm -hmm. And this doctor replies, heavens no, we can take care of that with medicine. And I came up out of my chair, you got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. They just operated on my mother for the same thing. Yeah. Had to reoperate again because of a wreck. And now they can do it with medicine? And it wasn't too long after that I was contacted by Russ and Dr. Sim uh, Dr. Simpson, doctor, but anyway. Um, and then the case evolved from yeah. there. You know, a lot of people, any normal person, when they were told something like this might have happened to themselves or their family members, I think their initial response would be, I don't believe it. Nobody would do that to me. Was that your initial yes. response? Yes. Yeah. But when, as the story unfolded, how did your feelings change? Well, the night, I think the feelings changed drastically the night that they had a big gathering of people at a church in Reading. Right. These and are all patients. These people. are all patients. And yeah. the lawyers from this area, they had some Texas lawyers there. And yeah. one of the lawyers said, okay, we want to hear your stories. Yeah. And so all these people were talking about what things, and the more they talked, the better I got, because there was one lady who said, my mother had lung cancer. Yeah. Yes, she was going to die, yeah. but they gave her a heart operation. She died on the table. Yeah. And she said, and this was her word, she didn't need to die that day. Yeah. And she was right. Another cowboy got up and says, I got bucked off a horse, broke a rib, next thing I know, they're opening my chest. Yeah. And these stories kept going on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you heard, the matter you got, because you could see from a layman's terms, these were frivolous operations. They were yeah. operating on other than healthy people. They were healthy. They didn't right. need to do that. Now, and, Russ, you brought up a point earlier about um, this medical center had a stellar reputation. Right. And the reason they did was because they did a lot of heart operations, but a lot of their victims slash patients, right, had great recoveries, didn't they? Correct. And so what these doctors would do, they would go around the country and they would talk about their success. And what they would do is they would compare Reading Medical Center saying, you know, the people that we operate on have less complications than the other doctors. You can go to these big institutions and they have more complications. Yeah. Well, the reason was is because the majority of the people they were operating on were healthy people. Right. So there are very serious complications that can sure. happen. But if you're operating on healthy people, you have a better chance of less complications. Yeah. The problem was is that there are serious complications that can even occur to some healthy people. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to Shirley. Mm -hmm. This was a complication and she should have never had the surgery. Right. And obviously if she wouldn't have had the surgery, that would have never got messed up. And then she didn't get the blood to her brain. And so basically, she had brain damage right. as a result of a complication from a totally unnecessary surgery. Yeah, I, I think the lesson always to be learned in cases like this is never take uh, verbatim the word of anybody. Get a second opinion, correct? Well, this has made a whole new meaning on second opinions. Right. It really has. Yeah. And But their technique was they've got you into the hospital. They do the test. You've got to have it tomorrow. It's scary. It's scary. Yeah. yeah, it was a scam. So, yeah, you know, in the end, you know, there was a lot of money paid out. Um, the doctors walked. That's a good term to yeah. use, right? Mm -hmm. What would you have liked to have seen done to these doctors? My dad's life basically was destroyed mm -hmm. because of what happened to my mother. Yeah. And he lived another seven years after she passed away. Mm -hmm. But because of the fact that he had to stay at home and take care of her, he never got the exercise he needed. And he had back problems. And his health got worse and worse and worse. So basically, Dr. Moon and their band of butchers destroyed my dad's life and almost broke him financially. Broke his heart, broke his physical ability to do things, and also broke him financially because the medicine that my mother was on was not covered by Medicare. So yeah. it almost wiped him out completely yeah. out. And the fact that his life was wiped out, my mother's life was out, and Moon's wasn't. 
our RVs wasn't, and also Dr. Bouchette's wasn't. Yeah. I mean, sure, they lost their license, and but they put enough yeah. money away, yeah. they didn't need to do any more anyway. Right. And right. so their lives went on. My it, folks didn't. As you well know, this is a very complex case, complicated. There were a lot of factors that Russ and his law firm had to face. For example, tenant maybe filing bankruptcy, you know, because they were in precarious financial conditions. What do you think about the way that Russ and his firm handled your case? Oh, I think very well. I think they did a pretty darn good job considering the vastness of it. And the settlement was okay. I mean, yeah. they had to divide that amongst a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I can remember one night my dad came to me, and this was just prior to the settlement, and the lawsuit was going on. It, it, it was in the process of being settled. Yeah. And my dad said, I'm broke. He said, I don't have any more money. Yeah. And I said, don't worry about it, Dad. We're okay. We'll, we'll take care of you. But can you imagine talking to your oldest son and right. telling him you're broke? And he had a pension. He had Social Security. He had set himself up fairly good. My mom did, and him did a little bit of traveling. Yeah. And they were living the way they wanted to live. Right. And all of a sudden, it stopped. And then he was broke. Right. And it, it broke his heart that way, too. Yeah. Broke and, his spirit. Right, and then the settlement, and then he felt pretty good about the settlement. Yeah. He said, this will give me some money to live the rest of my life, and it did. Okay, so, and it wasn't huge, but it was good enough. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for taking your time to be here today. Um, your message is heard loud and clear, and I hope everybody goes for that second opinion. Thank you. Well, well I hope so. I know I will. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
it's stressful, right? Correct. Right. But when you have a law firm like your own who's standing up for these people who, you know, who were victimized. Right. You know, sometimes they don't want to come forward because they think it's stressful. Right. It, it's, it's uh, let me say, it's particularly true in cases like this where something was done that was unnecessary. Yeah. Because unlike traditional medical malpractice cases yeah. where your clue is something went wrong, you don't know what went wrong, but you yeah. had some complication, so you go ask a, doc a lawyer, did the doctor do something right? Yeah. When, when you um, have an unnecessary procedure, you don't have those warnings. You don't, you, you don't want to believe anything was done wrong, and you're less likely to want to get involved in litigation. Right. Um, and you, you, I think at the bottom line, you just can't believe. That, in a sense, you feel like you were victimized but tricked, and hey, wait a minute, I don't want to admit that. I don't yeah. want to admit that I let someone do that to me. Right. And if I could comment on that, because I, um, I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of patients. And uh, so, because um, people would ask, well, you know, if you didn't have anything wrong with you, like you had your knee surgery, but you didn't have any heart pain or anything, why would you let them talk you into doing like this heart surgery? Yeah. But it wasn't what they had, though. It wasn't a situation where, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, you might have something wrong with your ankle, and then you could go out and get a second opinion. Yeah. Here, the doctor looks you in the eye and says, if you don't have this surgery, you're going to die. Mm. But then what was, to me, almost more egregious than saying it to you, if you would be like a tough guy and you would say, no, I'm not having this done, then what Dr. Moon and Dr. RV would do is they would go out and talk to your wife, and they would say, look, your husband is stubborn. If he leaves here, he's going to die. Are there many cases like that? Yes. Really? I can't convince your husband, but I'm telling you this. If he leaves that hospital yeah. and he dies, it's on your shoulder, yeah. not mine. So let's talk about some of the, real quickly, the complications of unnecessary surgery. Okay. Sure. You open up the sternum, right? Yeah. You, and you, you expose yourself to germs and possible, you know, uh, other diseases, right? What has happened to some of these patients sure. who had unnecessary surgery? Some of the patients died yeah. as, a result, as a result of the surgery. As a result of the surgery. So that's a wrongful death. Yes. Okay. And we had in this um, case uh, by the end with the 800, I believe, and I don't have the number exactly, but I believe it was, a, I believe there were 58 people, people that, died. that died, whatever, okay. during this process. Some by complications, others passed away, but yes. some by complications. Others had severe strokes. Um, as a result of the surgery. Directly as a result of the surgery, correct. Really? In fact, um, we, Shirley Wooten, um, one of the uh, people that will be interviewed, she passed away. Her son will talk. She ultimately um, had a stroke. Yeah. Um, other people had complications. Again, as I said earlier, you would take the saphenous veins out of their legs. They right. would get an infection. Um, and then they would have um, they would have to have amputations. Right. Let me let me answer this question. The, in the settlement, I think, whatever the amount of money that the average person received, do they receive free medical care going forward for complications as a result of the unnecessary surgery? Um, there some organization I know the Reading Medical Center changed its name. They were sold. They're now I think the Shasta Medical Center. Correct? Shasta Regional Medical Regional. Center. Okay. Do, do does is anybody providing any kind of no expense medical care to the people who have complications as a result of this case? Um, I guess uh, the answer is is no. Uh, um, from a legal standpoint, what happened? They received a settlement. Yeah. Um, and that's it. It, yes, but as part of the negotiations, the uh, the patients did not have to pay back for the the surgeries before. Yes. Okay. And then you know going forward, yeah. it, that would be covered either by you know Medicare yeah. or by health insurance. Yeah. Um, but they didn't have they didn't you have to use their settlement for future medical right. treatment. And, and and as you can imagine, um, they might not want to sign up for 
future medical care with the people that they learned right. had just screwed them. Yeah, yeah. By the, by the way, those two doctors, Moon turned his license in. Yes. Okay, he's playing golf someplace around here, very wealthy, correct? Yes. And really, Vasquez, yeah. he is still got his medical license, but he can't perform surgery, is that right? He can't, yeah, he cannot participate in any heart surgeries. Because he blamed Moon, basically. He bl yeah, he blamed Moon. Yeah. yeah. But that was part of the agreement. Yeah. And then... So here, two last questions. At the end of the day, in the beginning, there were rallies sponsored by and paid for by Tenet. You know, these doctors are great and everything. And you're the bad guys coming in and trying to stir up trouble, right? Right. Uh, at the end of the day, how is the community look at these doctors? at the hospital and at your law firm. Okay. So um, I believe at the end of the day, uh, um, people are um, extremely grateful, I believe, for the courage that these patients showed. Yes. Because as a result of that, again, uh, we kicked Tenet out of this community. Mm -hmm. The bad doctors can no longer do the heart surgeries. Uh, we have two hospitals in this community, which we need. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's now been renamed Shasta Regional Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, it's taken a number of years, but patients have gone back there. It's a good hospital now. So whatever that was good for the community. The other thing that, that the patients in our firm take great pride in is that before this case, uh, the number of heart surgeries that were being done in Reading was four to five times the national average. It wasn't something in our water, right? right. And so hundreds, thousands of people were having unnecessary surgeries. Mm -hmm. That's now stopped. Yes. And so now the number of surgeries that are and, being- And the public recognizes that. Yes. Okay, good. And, and so now it's back to the normal average from right. around the country. And so that's saving, you know, carnage, whatever right. with, you know, a lot of people. That's a, that's a good word to use, carnage, because that's exactly what you stopped. That's exactly what you stopped. And uh, I want to thank both of you for being on this program and this crusade to get justice for these people. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.